And uh, speaking about kindness now, the next person is a very kind person. I've known her now a few years. Uh, we came across her on Facebook. She's one hell of a researcher. She does an awful lot of work. Uh, she's a very kind person, extremely generous. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting herself and her mother, who was a very good dancer in her 80s, I think, in Newry last, last year. And she's traveled all the way from Newry by herself yesterday uh, to speak to us today about her own particular interest. Uh, and I'm talking about, of course, Patrice, Patrice Campbell. celebrate Mind Freedom Ireland's 10th anniversary. Um, I want to talk a moment um, just to reflect on what Jim and Mary Maddock, um, their human rights activism, has achieved in 10 years. Uh, Mind Freedom Ireland has worked very hard without any funding whatsoever, relying solely on your general support. It has earned an impressive record since 2003, uh, through the following. It's a long list. <laughs> um, They've established links with the European Network and World Network of Ex-Users and Survivors of Psychiatry, supported the petition and signature gathering campaign, We Deserve to Know the Truth About Psychiatric Drugs, organized by Nuria O'Mahony. They've given evidence to the Oreacta Subcommittee on Health, which published its report on the adverse effects of psychiatric drugs in 2007. They've conducted an ongoing letter writing campaign in the national press, participated in RTE programs and other media programs. <coughs> Um, but you'll see it on their website as well. They've mounted exhibitions and information stands at conferences in Ireland, UK, Germany, Denmark, and America. They've made submissions to the Mental Health Commission, the Expert Group, the Vision for Blue Change Blueprint, amendments to the 2001 Mental Health Act, and proposed capacity legislation. Um, they've liaised with independent MEP Kathy Synod in making submissions to the EU Green Paper on Mental Health. They've established collaborative links with the International Network Towards Alternatives in Recovery, Psych Rights in Alaska, the Soteria Network in the UK, the Campaign Against Psychiatric Assault in Canada, and Patients' Rights Advocacy in New Zealand. They formed a close alliance with Asylum and the UK Organization for Democratic Psychiatry and its campaign for the abolition of the schizophrenic label. They were represented by the late John McCarthy at the UN Ad Hoc Committee on Disability. They facilitated the establishment an inaugural meeting of Hearing Voices Network in Cork, November 2006. I have to go to the next slide because they've done so much. Um, <laughs> they've, organ <laughs> um, yeah, they've organized the first ever anti-electroshock protest in Ireland in May 2007, with further protests 2008, 9, 10, and 11. They've supported amnesties in Ireland, Amnesty Ireland's campaign against psychiatric human rights abuse. They've supported the Delete 59B campaign from, to ban forced electroshock. Um, they facilitated a weekly support stand by me support group. Facilitated a weekly a little help for my friends support group. They organized Robert Whittaker's uh, talk or um, Epidemic Exposed, Our Magic Bullets and Illusion in 2011. They organized a talk and launch of Terry, Dr. Terry Lynch's new book, Selfhood, in 2012. They organized a self-help discussion group for about that book, and they've organized today's anniversary event. So they've been very busy. Um, I hope you'll visit Mind Freedom Ireland's website. Here you will learn about the heroic people who have helped shape Ireland into becoming one of the world's most recognized countries for engaging human rights issues and mental health. Um, uh, to begin, Right. Uh, today, I'll discuss how I believe the biomedical model of psychiatry possesses an intrinsic finality for its own sake, and how, partly upheld by borrowing its power from medicine, neurology, and discourse, how this caused serious harm to my family. 
I will then show empirical evidence in companion animal studies of holistic healing and emotional distress that suggest intersubjective properties of emotional attuneness, such as love and compassion, and how these affect human lives. I will begin by sharing with you an abridged version of a story of loss, injustice, and holistic healing. A few days after my 18th birthday, my father suddenly passed away. My brother was just 15. We never fully grieved as a family or processed this huge loss when it happened. Eventually, my brother began to experience an emotional breakdown, mainly because of the continued bereavement. So, out of fear, I took him to a mental health facility, and after a few days of heavy sedation, he settled down again. But crucially, his unresolved trauma was ignored, and instead he was medicalized and was told he had a chemical imbalance and was labeled bipolar, a very popular DSM label in 1991. He was started on Haldol and Prozac, neuroleptics and SSRIs, and so it began. Within a few weeks, he wasn't himself at all on these, on these powerful drugs. More diagnoses were added or dropped, depending on which factor was assigned to him. Over the long term, the various diagnoses that the psychiatrist used from the DSM led to his being prescribed a powerful um, selection of psychotropic drugs that created the very symptoms that they were supposed to heal. These drugs also caused serious weight gain. Over time, the weight gain led to hypothyroidism, which led to diabetes, and then sleep apnea. All of this was a result of these drugs, not to mention all of the other adverse effects such as facial tics, tremors, akathisia. When I asked all of his revolving teams of psychiatrists what all these drugs were for and why all the diagnoses kept changing, they kept telling me the same thing over and over again. It's the illness, he's getting worse. It's the chemicals. It's the chemical imbalance in his brain, it's worsening. Nothing they ever said to me ever made any sense. But now I realize it was the treatment that was getting worse. They told me to stop interfering, to stay away and let him grow up. I remember the psychiatrist saying to my family that my brother didn't want to get better. They isolated my brother from us when he loved the people that he loved, when he needed them the most. Although at that time I had no formal training in anything to do with mental illness, my intuitive self told me something was dreadfully wrong with all of this, because we knew his emotional breakdown was because of Dad. By April of 2001, ten years later, he had been assigned to yet another psychiatrist for just six months. And during that time, he had been in the emergency room at the hospital three different times due to symptoms of toxicity, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. I told my family we needed to get him off these drugs to start over again, and that if we didn't, his heart would quit. And that's exactly what happened six weeks later. These nagging doubts and suspicions that I had, that psychiatrist silence, they weren't without foundation. But I was too late. My only brother died of sudden cardiac arrest at the age of 33. No matter what time may pass, nothing changes the fact that every day I regret having ignored my inner voice. The greatest trick psychiatry ever pulled on me was convincing me that my gut instinct didn't exist. Naturally, I descended into a state of complete shock and despair. I had to do something purposeful and meaningful about this very unfair tragic loss. So I set out to create my own sense of justice for my brother. And here's what I discovered along the way. I discovered that there is no scientific evidence of mental illness. There never was. My brother was never bipolar. What he had was an emotional breakdown due to overwhelming stress, mainly from the unresolved grief. As award-winning medical and science investigative journalist Robert Whitaker wrote in his award-winning book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, They've never been able to find that people with schizophrenia have overactive dopamine systems. They've never been able to find that people with depression have underactive serotonin systems. They've never found consistently that any of these disorders are associated with any chemical imbalance in the brain. In this book, Princeton neuroscientist Barry Jacobs explains how these drugs work. They perturb the brain. For many people, this results in many toxic adverse effects, including, but not limited to, hypothyroidism, diabetes, tardive dyskinesia, akathisia, Parkinsonian-like shaking, insomnia, prefrontal cortex shrinkage, sudden cardiac arrest, suicide, homicide. These effects commonly turn up after prolonged use, defined as anything past six weeks, though in many cases, 
They've been reported within just days of taking these drugs. Mental illness. As a, as a disease, it lacks the four criteria required to be classed as a genuine medical illness. It lacks <coughs> etiology, it lacks pathology, it lacks a symptomology, and it lacks a course. The ICD, the International Classi Classification of Diseases, says that if just one of these criteria are missing, then it cannot therefore be a, de a genuine disease. But regrettably, the ICD-9, under outside pressure, ultimately allowed depression in as a disease because of symptomology. This is unheard of in real medicine, such as diabetes. I want to speak briefly about power of free discourse, because discourse helps constitute some of the power upon which the medical model of psychiatry does depend. Wittgenstein reminds us that words are deeds, and that given that a large part of the discourse of psychiatry is largely borrowed from general medicine and neurology, these words empower their field. This is a vast subject, so I can only briefly highlight some obvious examples. The late libertarian Dr. Thomas Siles said that mental illness is a metaphor for a behavior that is unacceptable to society. Many critics argue that the word patient belongs to genuine medicine and is also a way of establishing power. Psychotherapists and most psychologists call people who seek emotional support clients to denote the respectful relationship. Another word that I have trouble with is medicine. These chemicals, they're not medicine. They're drugs that, because of the effects that they're causing. Another part that I have trouble with is the word side effects. This is often used. There are, in my opinion, no side effects in psychiatry. What people are experiencing are these main drugs only effects, or, or um, main effects or only effects, because there is no physical disease that the drug can target. Sudden cardiac arrest is not a side effect. Informed consent. This doesn't exist in my opinion. How can anyone give informed consent for ECT when nobody knows how it works? <laughs> the recipient is more than likely on psychiatric drugs, which impairs thought processes. So how can they give informed consent while under the influence of such drugs? Is this awareness not impaired by the drugs? Before I continue, may I just say, I am not anti-psychiatry. What I am is pro-truth, pro-science, pro-human rights, and pro-justice. <laughs> Dr. David Healy warned of suicidal ideation and healthy volunteers in a 2000 study of Prozac. Moreover, GlaxoSmithKline announced in April of 2011, 11 years later, that their SSRI drug Paxil, by a different name, shows a seven-fold increase in suicidal tendencies over placebos. Prozac, about which Dr. Healy warned over a decade earlier, is also from the same class of drugs. And we're not surprised that the research shows now that these drugs are linked to decreased lifespan by 25 years, and that's on the increase. Maryland psychologist Edmund H. Piggott revealed that researchers along the National Institute of Mental Health and the American Journal of Psychiatry knew during their research trials that these SSRIs were ineffective and produced serious risks to health, but they hid the results. Because of such corruption in research, many prescribing practitioners had no idea that Prozac was actually the cause of suicide. How can a practitioner make an informed decision as to the risk-benefit ratio for each client or patient? Practitioners need to know the truth so they are fully informed of the responsibility that they accept when prescribing drugs that may induce serious adverse effects such as suicide and sudden cardiac arrest and other serious events. A growing number of practitioners, psychiatrists, GPs, and the like are also questioning the protocols and why they were not told that psychiatric drugs can cause sudden, sudden cardiac arrest, suicide, and homicide, and other serious events. For a growing number of practitioners, the current state of affairs is simply not good enough. All of the reductionist research that underpins psychiatry was lifted from the hard sciences of biology and chemistry. Unfortunately, the problem with that is that such reductionist approaches could never objectively measure subjective environmental experiences that influence human behavior. Essentially, human behavior cannot be reduced or quantified and categorized for diagnosis in a manual. So far, I've outlined the fact that psychiatry does not possess the criteria of a genuine medical discipline. 
and that so-called mental illness does not objectively exist as a genuine illness. But I'd like to talk briefly also about the DSM, psychiatric diagnosis. This is warehoused by the DSM both conceptually and functionally because of its content. The drugs that are prescribed through its application are designed by Big Pharma and they are approved by the FDA. Despite decades of expensive research, psychiatry has still yet to scientifically define mental illness, but that never stopped them from writing a manual suggesting they had. Psychotherapist and author Gary Greenberg interviewed the lead editor of the DSM-4 nearly three years ago in 2010. This is what the editor of the DSM-4 said about mental illness. That's what he said. That's the editor. Greenberg writes in the article of his, of his amazement, the guy who wrote the book on mental illness, confessing that these concepts are virtually impossible to define precisely, with bright lines at the boundaries. These kinds of histories and ties suggest a special interest political model. I'll come back to this article again. Harvard clinical and research psychologist Paula J. Kaplan, PhD, was invited to be a part of the talk but sorry, part of the task force committee on the DSM-4. But she finally resigned after citing many instances where the research was unscientific. In her book, They Say You're Crazy, Paula demonstrates the greatest amount of information about the invalid and unscientific nature of the basis of the DSM. Moreover, people are rarely warned about the disabling harm that comes from having been diagnosed through the DSM. As a result, Paula has documented such stories of harm at psychdiagnosis.weebly.com. Naturally, a very obvious question arises given all of this information. How are people saying the medications are working if we know the drugs don't work? So take for example a teenager who has been prescribed a psychiatric drug and over time regained confidence and desire to belong to his community again. Experts believe this healing may have occurred through the renewed and concerned love and devotion of his reassuring parents, therapists, friends, and other community members. In nearly all cases where psychiatric drugs were, are prescribed and the patient improves, the drugs are given the credit for the healing, while the support and the love and the regard and the care, they're dismissed as if they didn't contribute to the healing. Furthermore, Dr. Peter Bregan has found episodes of extreme emotional overwhelm often resolve on their own, within a few months anyway. Some people never require any help. But there's more to it than that. I feel the need to explore the mindset behind this notion a little bit further. In 1932, Tolman wrote about expectancy theory in his book, Purposive Behavior in Animals and Man, which highlights that we are more than just cognitive responses to stimuli. Evolving this theory into mental health currency today, Professor Irving Kirsch conducted research into the placebo effect and hypnosis. He found that antidepressants are no more effective than sugar pills, also known as the placebo effect. He believes the operational process behind the placebo effect is response, response expectancy. In his impeccable research, Kirsch shows that people will derive benefit from what they expect out of such treatment. What Kirsch, what Kirsch suggests is how powerful the placebo effect on the mind truly is. But there's more still, and this is very important. As I stated, the environment is crucial to healing. Bruce Lipton, a cell biologist, originally showed in 1967 that the environment shapes genetics and behavior with his stem cell experiments. So we know for sure the environment is crucial to shaping behavior. In this context of environment, the treatment from the practitioner is also very important. Practitioners who are compassionate and empathetic naturally want people to feel well. Through this caring attitude, the person is in a better position to receive better care than from a practitioner who's cold and detached. Moreover, if the person has a good support network in his or her home, the healing is more likely. Recently, Robert Whitaker de delivered a stellar evidence-based argument for why psychiatry should re-examine its prescribing protocols for psychosis. He meticulously integrated the salient points of Finland's open dialogues therapies along with Chicago's Martin Harrow's conclusions, which were, that some people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia can do well over the long term without antipsychotics, and that these protocols need to allow for that possibility. 
He then punctuated this with very important discoveries of Holland's wondrous new research, which showed that antipsychotics could be hampering long-term functional recovery, and the methods of assessing merits of short-term antipsychotics that psychiatry uses are flawed. If you haven't already, I hope you'll take the time to read this methodically perceptive piece, which can be found at Robert Whittaker's comprehensive web, mag web magazine, www.madinamerica.com. Robert Whittaker's work is an excellent example of the quality hindsight that is occurring regularly. Psychiatry now has another onus for change. Given all of the issues outlined, many prescribing practitioners are rethinking a social-based paradigm that focuses on drug-free or reduced prevention and treatment, and they're returning to the existentialist, humanistic-based understanding of emotional distress of the human condition. Going back to the article that we had before, Greenberg continues, Diagnoses of autism, attention deficit disorder, and bipolar, uh, bipolar disorder skyrocketed. He tells how the editor of the DSM and uh, thinks that his manual inadvertently facilitated these epidemics and, in the bargain, fostered an increasing tendency to chalk up life's difficulties to mental illness and then treat them with psychiatric drugs. And he says, we made mistakes that had terrible consequences. To echo David Oak's words, there needs to be consequences for their mistakes. Despite my raw grief, I had already learned well enough to stay away from psychiatry. I knew my overcoming this pain of loss was going to take everything I had and then some. Criticizing psychiatry became fundamental to fighting such unfathomable injustice. But my love of animals and nature was very much about my humanistic approach in life. Suddenly their presence in my life became very necessary to me at that time. My walks with my Rottweiler at the time proved to be essential to my well-being. The act of walking itself, whether or not I had a dog, was a big relief for my pent-up feelings. And she sat there at my side in a space that knew no judgment. As those who love a dog will know, the sense of comfort and peace that they can bring is very real. So I returned to working with dogs again. My knowledge of psychology, psychological theory helped, but it was my love of and experience with dogs that was surely handed down from my father that enabled me to really understand them. My service grew rapidly and I enjoyed giving local talks about how dog psychology works. And I began to see how this positively affected people's lives. I slowly started to live again. My clients would give me feedback about how not only did their dog's behaviors change, but in a phenomenal way, so too did their personal and social lives. This kind of work restored much meaning and pur purpose to my life again. Interestingly, as I was helping others, I was also helping my bereavement. My work was truly an occupational therapy. So I decided to write about it academically. I began to research my topic within companion animal studies, and I found many studies that mirrored almost identically what I had been experiencing, what my clients had been experiencing, which demonstrated that this effect crossed cultures and was not specifically tied to any one characteristic or trait. Holistic social paradigms in healing emotional distress. They also include aspects of humanistic psychotherapy and analytical psychology, whereby people feel a connectedness with other beings that bring about a sense of healing and positive growth. <coughs> Governments are also taking note of successful social paradigm treatment programs. The Open Dialogue Project program has impressed authorities with empirical evidence that demonstrates 85% recovery rates in drug-free or drug-reduced treatment programs for schizophrenia. Along with other effects, the program demonstrates that if practitioners apply empathy, regard, and respect to the person, the result is an improved understanding, better treatment, and long-term healing. Robert Weiss theorizes that some features of one's psychological well-being can be met primarily through social relationships. Weiss's theory transcends animal-assisted interventions, AAI, and human-animal bond narratives, especially the popular role of animals as sources for their dream behavior. Such studies are influenced by Carl Rogers' non-evaluative uh, empathy and unconditional positive regard. There is a theory that states humans are attracted by other living things and have an innate need to attend to them. Harvard professor Wilson theorizes that biophilia, which has profound connections to nature, has biological origins, and, ha and as also has the adaptations required to ensure survival. 
This could explain why so many people find such joy and pleasure from being with an animal. I would like to share some seminal companion animal studies that show empirical and robust findings which support the value of animal-assisted interventions. The science of occupational, behavioral, and cognitive therapy is woven through some of these studies, particularly about how working with dogs has had a positive impact on one's emotional distress. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, he often kept his beloved dog Jophie at his side, and in the therapy he encountered during psychoanalysis sessions, he kept her at his side, and he would talk through her to his clients. These are a list of different studies that you can take a look at if you want to, I can send them to you um, for further depth. Uh, I won't go into them now since we're limited on time. But these are excellent post and pre and post treatment crossover studies. Some of them, they mirror a lot of um, what we are also discovering about how dogs have been able to help people through emotional distress. We'll just go ahead and go past that. I was going to read that. Um, while companion animal studies and animal assisted therapies are not a panacea for emotional distress, the qualitative research used in gathering the data of these studies assumes that objective science is best left to the hard sciences like chemistry. Qualitative research is interested only in exploring the human condition and behaviors. The qualitative method purposeful, purposefully avoids a reductionist viewpoint, trading re realist epistemology for relativist ontology with the goal of exploring canine human <coughs> relationships and how they affect us. This approach affords participants an opportunity to assign meaning to their lived experiences with their animals. The enterprise of assigning that value to the relationship is as important to the relationship itself, which is what I experienced. These studies and therapies and their methodologies, like many of other holistic programs, are constructive stepping stones for people to live more productive and meaningful lives. So it's safe to say the approach is not just about drug-free holistic beliefs, it's also about intersubjective relationships. In the science of relationships, quantum physicists and theorists know that two pieces of scientific fact are now true that they didn't know before. One, the space between us is not empty, it's full of intelligence and energy. And number two, that space between us is, has the capacity to act as a conduit for the experiences within our bodies. The word for this discovery hasn't even been agreed yet. Quantum hologram you may have heard, or the field of <coughs> the tag with zero point gravity, the mind of God by Stephen Hawking. Nature's Mind, Dr. Edward Mitchell, The Matrix, Max Planck. What has scientists talking is that this process is not achieved through thinking from the brain, it is achieved by feelings and emotions coming from the heart, known as coherent, heart-based emotions. The science is showing that our hearts are 500 times stronger than our brains in terms of electromagnetic fields. When we change this field through our feelings and emotions, we can change the atoms within, so much so that we are changing our physical reality. This kind of study warrants further exploration, but it does suggest the relationships between people and their dogs are intersubjective and that our dogs are capable of affecting our electromagnetic fields and emotions, and we are incapable of affecting theirs. And this here is a printout of a cardio imagery between a boy and his dog, which the father was the, was the doctor who did it, of his son and the boy's dog, but their rhythms are exactly the same when they're together. And this would be suggestive of an uh, intersubjective relationship. What I also hope in showing that is that people will bring their dogs inside. <laughs> today, today I've outlined some of psychiatry's failures, which have caused serious harm in my family. The loss of my brother has caused me to dedicate my life to helping others through sharing, education, and research, so that they might avoid the same catastrophic loss and continue hopefully living productive and meaningful lives. Please take my advice. Listen to your instincts. Listen to the empty spaces between one another. Hopefully the information I've shared about companion animal studies, which is very short and abridged, and the intersubjective nature of relationships with our dogs shows that emotional distress can be allayed or healed through compassionate and loving relationships, not just with our human companions, but also potentially with our companion animals as well. I know this was my experience. Thank you.